Hello, I'm Bonnie Rabakoff, and this week we are back in the kitchen at the American Restaurant with their executive chef, Debbie Gold. Debbie, thank you for inviting us back. Oh, I'm excited you're coming back to the kitchen. <laughs> my favorite, my favorite place to be. <laughs> so let's talk about first this space. The American is stunning. A stunning Gorgeous. space. Yes. How did the space come about? Who's its creator? The creator would be uh, Don Hall Sr. Oh, yes. uh, he wanted sort of a gift to Kansas City and he uh, went and found the best to help create what you see here. Um, he had um, James Beard was the initial uh, food consultant when the restaurant originally opened. Uh, he had Warren Plattner as the architect, who uh, also was uh, the architect for Windows on the World, if you've uh, been in there. And if you look around, there's things that are very it's a reminiscent. reminiscent. Of that. You have yes. the light woods and the brass, and um, just a very similar feel. Obviously, the big windows. Right. Uh, the ceiling was created just for this dining room, and if you look at it, uh, their little hearts because it was a Valentine's Day gift uh, in Kansas City. Kansas City. So and it's know. just so much history and it's it's um, a classic and uh, timeless. Timeless. It's timeless. You do, do not know when this was created and that you know that is uh, a huge compliment to the people who, who did it. Okay you have let alone the inspiration of a gorgeous face to work with what is your concept for the food here at the American? Um, you know, I try to keep the food uh, simple. I try to bring out the natural flavors of the food, whether it's how the preparation is or what um, I pair it with. Um, I want the food to be balanced. Um, generally, the food here looks very, very beautiful on the plate, but it it's not just about how it looks. If it doesn't taste it's amazing, work. all the looks in the world mean nothing. I like to uh, support our local farmers. I like to use things that they're growing on the menu. Uh, one reason I just said was to support the farmers. The other is you're not going to get any better quality nope. of product and you're not going to get any better flavor out of a product except for what comes directly from the farms and especially the local farmers that we have here. And you have a long history of cooking seasonal and local. And you said supporting our community. Absolutely. We're a member of that. Absolutely. But also in addition to that, we just, we say this almost every week, if you don't start out with a great product, it doesn't matter how you season yeah, it. It doesn't cook. matter what you do to it. Doesn't it. Matter. It's, no. And the other part that I find very um, important after you get that product, mm -hmm. which you know a lot of chefs know, that's you know, non debatable. If you don't mm -hmm. start out with that, then you're not going to have the product. But there's how you handle it. Um, I tell my cooks all the time it's about respecting the Respect. product. Um, I think is huge. And then it's also the pre preparation of the food and the execution of, of how you either put a salad together or you cook a steak or you cook a piece of fish. All right, so you're providing training now that once upon a time you were the recipient of. Where did you get your training for chef? Yes, um, I lived and worked in France for four years. Honestly, when I got uh, decided I wanted to be a cook, um, my parents tried to talk me out of it. <laughs> Let's get serious, right? <laughs> you know, well, and hours, no benefits. Yeah, you know, on your feet, it's hot, and you're Why not you a huge person to, be no. to begin <laughs> with. And, and it wasn't traditional. That I mean, you're one of the pioneers, the trailblazers. Women weren't executive chefs. We still don't have very an abundant few. of them. There's a lot more now, but a very, yes, very yes. few. Yep. And um, did this. they take you seriously in France? Well, in France, no. I was sort of the cute little American. Oh, there you go. So. And then it was like, no, no, I have a knife. Show me what to do. <laughs> I want to do it. But there was also some kitchens that wouldn't take me um, 
just to spend a month or two in the kitchen because I was a woman and they didn't allow that. So They didn't allow it. All right. Yeah. But you did get into some fabulous kitchens. What was probably your greatest inspiration while you were in France? You know, I have to say it was just um, the different kind of foods that I saw, the quality of the quality. product. You know, when I lived there, and I know it's changed now, when you walk down the street, you would see what was in season by what was at the market. Mm -hmm. They generally did not bring in product from anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So the foundation for your seasonal cooking was right in, in your training in France. Right, absolutely. And the other thing I think was a great inspiration for me is the work ethic. They did it correctly. And uh, that's why execution is really yes. important to me. And I don't like shortcuts. You don't take shortcuts over there. You you you'll hear about it. Right. And so. you can tell the and you can tell the difference yeah, I with, think you can. with that shortcut. Yes. All right, you came back to America and what did you do? Charlie Trotter's well, restaurant had just opened. I worked there for almost two years. I worked everything, every station, including pastries. Um, and then uh, I did another little stint in France for two more years. And what was fun about that is I could uh, research older French recipes and play and figure out how to sort of modernize them, get away from the flowers and the heavy sauces and and sort of like a fresher, healthier, healthier, <laughs> healthier. Yes. So you went back there, rant. So then you're getting your expertise in the area of executive chef, which we know is very different from right. chef or cook. Right. Okay, and then you came back to America. And what did you do? My uh, was asked to interview for the uh, chef job here at the American. Oh my. Way back when. Way back when, coming from <laughs> Chicago, a great food town, yes. and bringing all that training and, and that tradition here to the American. So when you work with your cooks, what is what are your messages to them? What do you want them to take away from their time with you? Respecting the product right. that they're working with, working with it correctly, not taking the shortcuts. The restaurant business is not an easy business. No? There's a lot of time, it's very physical, you're on your feet, mm. there's hot oil, there's fire, there's knives. Um, so you have to be serious. Um, but because of all the hours and time together, there's, there's a part where you have to be focused and serious, but you have to enjoy yourself. I had a sous chef that worked for me, and he uh, was relatively new as a manager. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, how do you inspire the cooks? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what, when I cook something, no, no matter how many times in a row it's the same plate, if it doesn't make me salivate, it's not going to make anybody no. else. Okay. I've got to look at it and go, oh my God, this is the most perfect dish. Oh my goodness. And that will be felt to the customer when they receive so it. So your inspiration is the food itself. Yes, absolutely. The food itself mm -hmm. and making sure it's the best before you ever even touch it. So chef, what are we going to make in the kitchen today? Well, I know um, it's just about the holidays and mm -hmm. we have Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and uh, Christmas and Hanukkah and whatever other holiday mm -hmm. everybody celebrates and it's a big deal. So I'm going to do something that's a little bit different okay. that seems a little scary and I don't think it is. I'm going to take a whole duck uh, and I'm going to confit the whole duck. Okay. So we've not done that before. What does confit mean? Confit is a term. Uh, it's actually sort of originated in the Middle Ages where it's a way of conserving um, food. So they would uh, pack it in salt first uh, to dry out the meat a little bit and then they cook it very, very slowly in its own fat, which was a, a preserving yeah. technique. So it, it was for safety, obviously flavor, and we know we're moving back to the slow cook movement. Absolutely. And I, I tell our people all the time, it doesn't mean that you're spending hours in the kitchen, you can be going and doing other things. It is just an approach to cooking. I'm one of those people that's a little intimidated by duck, and I'm totally prepared to do this now. So let's, yes. Well, yes, this and this will be perfect. It'll be perfect. So you and I should go into the kitchen and Absolutely. do this. Absolutely. And excited. why don't you come with us?
We are in the kitchen at the American Restaurant with our executive chef, Debbie Gold. We're going to make a duck confit. Chef, where do we begin? Obviously with the duck. With the duck. How did you select? Now, what does a good duck look like? A good duck. Well, you want it to be nice and firm. Look at the breast is very nice. Mm -hmm. There's no bruises or marks on it. That's a sign that there was a problem with the bird earlier on. Um, and, um, you know, usually they run somewhere between three or four pounds. Okay, so that's what we have here, and he's been well cared for. He hasn't been misused in No, way. no, no, no. All right. We don't want to misuse no, this. And now I notice you're taking the I'm wings. I'm going to take the wing, and I'm just going to tuck them underneath so they don't okay. flop around. Okay. Now what are we going to okay. do? Okay, so Dr. now the confit process, which is a process used to conserve uh, animals. In the Middle Ages, they didn't want to keep their animals around in the winter. It was more costly and harder to keep them fed and alive. So in France, they, they would confit, which means to cook very slowly in the duck fat. Okay. So the first process is we got to draw out some of the moisture from the meat okay. because wetness moisture promotes bacteria. Exactly. Okay, so I've got a cup of salt. This is kosher salt? This is kosher okay. salt. I have some fresh thyme we're going to put in there for some flavor. So we're introducing flavor right from the very beginning. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to I yeah. Just time. No, no, we'll get to the rosemary. Well, you're jumping. You're I'm jumping. You're getting too excited. excited. I got a bay leaf. I'm uh -huh. just going to rip that that's up a, a little bit. One. Yes, it is. And then really all I'm you can chop it up a little bit, but I'm just going to break up. Oh, that can you smell it? Smell, yes. <laughs> it's just amazing. Oh, so, good things are happening. Now, in the Middle Ages, actually, black pepper, which is also uh, prohibits the growth of microorganisms, but in the day, the my medieval times, pepper was more expensive than okay. salt. So they used a little bit, but very sparingly. So we're just going to put a little bit in there. And that's freshly ground. I it's know. freshly ground. Yes, I just did that before we came. Okay. So we're going to mix this up. Now, another sort of ingredient that adds flavor, but also is used for uh, pre preserving yes. is I have a head of garlic that I peeled. Mm -hmm. And what I did is I took the garlic, yes. and this is a clove, and you just poke it right into the garlic. That way you don't lose it. You don't lose it. And so you're infusing even more flavor, but it also has practical application in that it prohibits the right. growth of bacteria. And I'm going to take a little bit of the salt. Kind of make a bed for With it. A little bit of a bed. Okay. Now, in the Middle Ages, they would have just packed it in the salt. And I don't think it's necessary really for us anymore. I just want to make sure it uh, gets cured a little bit with from the salt. Remove some of the moisture and, and it gets us some of the flavor that we're looking for. You can even put some inside it. Okay, so you could put some of the salt mixture inside on the top, on, on the bottom. All over. So now it's nicely seasoned, sitting in our salt. And I'm going to wrap this up, and I'm going to put this in the refrigerator overnight, or 12 hours, minimum 12 hours, but overnight is So that fine. took a matter of minutes to do, and you would just do it the day before and put it in the refrigerator. Correct. Are you ready to go? Okay, okay, so now it's the next day. It's magic. The next magic. We magic, do magic, here magic all the time. <laughs> Cooking's about magic. Cooking right? is about magic, and you do it. You do it well. All right. When the duck came out of the refrigerator from the night before, what did you do to get it ready for? You just it take hot? a damp paper towel. Yes. And you're gonna wipe off all the salt. It's real easy. And then what I did is I saved all our garlic cloves with uh, the clove in it. In it. Okay, so we took that out of the pan. Right. We dusted off the little duck and got all the salt off. Okay. Then what Then what did I here? did? So now this is a big saute or pot, I mm -hmm. should say, yeah. full of duck fat. And you may ask, what do you mean duck I fat? I did ask. I know. Where did you get all this duck fat? You buy it. You Rendered buy it. duck fat. It comes okay. in a pail. It's very good. It's like good. chicken fat or lard or whatever. Correct. Now, and I will say what's a little bit particular about this is it's a lot of duck fat. It is. <laughs> okay. 
But the fun part about this is you can save the duck fat. So but it can be reused. It can be reused, and it's right. really a good thing to reuse it. I bet you get some wonderful flavors. You do. You, you do. Okay. okay. So where does it go? So from now here? I'm gonna. And now you tied its little legs. I up. tied its little legs together. So you saw I tucked the arms, I the, the wings underneath. Okay, we want it close so together. So you want to kind of let it look like a duck when you're okay. well, done. Okay. Of course. I mean, all right. I mean, and then this is going to go back. You can in. put that right in. I'm going to put this in. You know. Oh, yep, that's all right. Girl. Okay. Okay. And, well, see, now we did that, but this is not going to splatter anywhere. You're not going to make a mess. So, now I've got the oven at about 300, 325. And how long is this little duck going to be cooking? It'll in be in there bath? for about an hour and a half. Now, here's the really important part about okay. this this is fat or oil. You do not want this to boil in the oven. It will boil if it's too hot. 350 is too hot. So what would you suggest we do? Usually about 300, 325 is good. Okay. So you right. get somebody to help you yeah. <laughs> to pick that up. And then we're going to put That's it in here. Chef Debbie Gold. <laughs> you got muscles. All right. So you set the timer. You don't want it above 3, 325. No, don't go any higher. And you can check. This, here's the best part of this hoe dish. You're done for right now. You can go watch the football game. You can go work on something else for right, dinner. Right. You can do anything Whatever. else you want to do. And that's one of the beauties of slow cooking is that you're not standing there dealing with it the whole time. Okay, Chef, duck All right. in the oven for an hour, hour and, and a half. half. About Are we ready? For 325 in the duck fat. Okay. Where you carefully. So we're going to pull this pull out. Pull this out, and you can have a helper. This is really good ab exercise. Yeah, there we go. When we're looking gray while yes. we're cooking. Well, one thing I want to mention, if you can notice, that the duck has been submerged in yes. the duck fat. So it's, that's important, Chef. So now we don't have to worry about the duck breast being medium rare, because we we cook the whole thing. It's ready to and go. It's, and From you don't. here on out, it's just going to get beautiful. So now okay. it's the secret to ending. So we have to be careful when we pull this because go it's going to be delicate. So now we pull it out, and I'm going to put it on this roasting pan. So you look at one of the signs. Look at how soft oh, the, the wings are. Heaven. And the bones are just starting to protrude. The best thing to do would be to put this in your refrigerator one more night, uncovered. Uncovered. Because uh, there's a thing that we call a, a, a pellicule, and it's a skin that forms. It dries out, and it forms on it. And that's the secret to some of the crispiness. OK, and we forget that. Even when you're going to cook turkey for Thanksgiving, if you can get it cleaned up and in the refrigerator and, overnight and let it get dry. Yes, get it, it dry. The, yeah, and then much I guess you better can put skin. Your seasoning or butter or whatever under the skin, but the skin needs to be dry. Right. Right. So now I kept this very simple, and I'm thinking flavors of France, where yes. the, you know confit comes from France. So let's stay in France. Okay, we're gonna stay in okay. France. Okay. So we're coming over here. So now, yes. I've just got the yellow onions, and I'm just going to cut them in half, okay. or I guess quarters, because be I've already peeled them. Onions. Okay, so so much flavor. You're just introducing flavor all along the way. Well, you know what? I I love onions, and um, and they're good for you. They're good for you, and when they cook down, they get nice and sweet. And they do. And okay. so now, uh, I think I did this last time with you. I just take the whole head of garlic. I've been doing it ever since. Because with my cauliflower. <laughs> so I want this to be, yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's going to add flavor when we're roasting. You don't have to sit there picking and peeling no. each little no. clove. You're going to get the same benefit of the yes. huge flavor. And it's not that. dirty, and it's no, not. No. And well, it's, you're picking good right, cauliflower. Right. So we're being consistent with the fat here. Yes. Yeah, so if you if you like last time when I did did the pork and the and the yeah. cauliflower, I'm yeah. reintroducing the same flavors to enhance them. So now, real simple, we're going to okay. take the onion and two things. The onions are going to cook down and get nice and sweet, and we can serve this with our duck. 
That's and the wonderful part about the dishes, many of the dishes that you do, is that what you're seasoning with also becomes a part, part of the, of the dish. dish. Right, and it, but now this has another purpose. Okay. We're gonna put the duck uh, on bed, top. Yep. It's a bed. It needs a little. It's its own feather bed. Exactly. And the French do that sort of thing. Yes. So, so look, now the garlic goes in there. The yes. onions go in there. Okay, and then we have thyme and a bay leaf, and, and I'm just, just putting them out just like that. Real simple. So you see the cover of food and wine yes. right there. Okay, here's another little thing that's yummy is I take my olives. And I notice you have a variety. We're going to put our duck right on, on top. Bed. Yes. Exactly. Now I notice you're leaving the, the twine on and we're still maintaining the shape of the duck. Right. See how it looks when it roasts? It'll yes. stay and look Beautiful. like a lovely duck. Oh. So now we're going to go in the oven. And uh, set the like? oven at about 400 because oh. we want crispy skin. And it's not about cooking the duck anymore. We've the duck done is that. cooked. We've done that. We now. want lovely crispy skin. So 400, and you're going to have to kind of check your oven, but I'd say somewhere about 40 minutes. Okay. My secret is I like set it for like every 20 minutes so I can check it. Just take a peek. And then I can put it in again. And, and this is the part you would do just before company or maybe companies arrived and they're sipping some right, wine. Right, and, and wine and you might have some cheese and crackers out. So are we ready to Mr. look? Duck, See if oh, it's ready. We are ready to look. Now we got to be careful. Oh yeah, please. Oh my God. Word is that gorgeous. So now look at how yummy and crispy our skin has. Our onions have cooked and perfection. caramelized. I would say we have perfection here. So we're gonna let that sit and cool down a little okay. bit. All right. And now then while we're doing that, we are going to make. I'm gonna make some uh, potato cakes okay. that I'm gonna saute with the duck fat okay. that's left over. And, and these are russet. These or are russet, russet potatoes. Russet potatoes. You Basic. just add it in water. So it doesn't color. So it doesn't color. But now here's uh, a little thing I like to do is you just take a regular cheese grater mm -hmm. and if you're going to make uh, having a lot of people over you need to do this little by little. The minute that these start to brown and oxidize they get a funny flavor and a funny color when they cook. Okay. So we're not going to do that. No we're not going to yeah. do that because you can start sauteing and then make some more you know do it in batches. But in the meantime. And you can also delegate some responsibility and yes. have someone help you. That's isn't that why we had children? Okay, that's why that's why God gave us children. Exactly. Yep. Come in and cook. And of course we know and your children have been in the kitchen with us. Oh absolutely. It really makes for a healthier lifestyle when they participate in the kitchen. You have selected the larger grape. You're doing that because um one, it's easier and two, uh, better okay. for me. Uh, yeah texture better uh, potato uh, flavor so look I can still use yes, that so I'm gonna put them back in the water all right. and now we're okay so now it's all grated and you don't that beautiful now what you've also done I'm putting a little salt and pepper on here yes what you've also done by grating it is brought out some of the exposed the starch of the potato which Another well, reason for russet because right. it is starchy. very starchy and I'm yeah. just gonna mix in the salt and pepper how pretty that is. Make okay. Potato lock pancakes. They make. That's how I make my latkes, yeah. actually. Okay. So I have some more duck now fat. Over here, you've been warming up a pan. Pan's and, hot. And our duck fat, which we're remaining true to the duck fat here. Oh, absolutely. Yep. We love the duck fat. Now I'm going to show you two different ways to do this. Okay. Here's my fancy way with my little ring mold. Okay. It takes a little bit longer, so a little popping. You do have to be careful because of the liquid All right. in Any the potato. Gonna make it pop. It's fat, it's gonna pop in the oil. And you just pack it in there. And I like to leave it sort of uh, medium low because that way it gets that nice crispy brown mm -hmm. potato cake crust. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's the fancy way. Okay, fancy. You pack it in there and you gotta let it sit or, or the potato latke way. Yeah. Which is our eyeball is good. Yep, and you just put it on there. And they both taste good. How and about they're that? yummy. Yeah.
And you know, some people put so much in potato pancakes and it's all about just... Now, you know, if anything, you can on the same cheese grater, maybe a little bit of onion and a little touch of garlic if you want, but that's, that's it. That's it. The duck is done. How the do duck is done. A duck? Okay, first off, we need to take the string that was on here off because we don't want to serve that. No, maybe not. So. And you've waited till this... It's about how long do it. You should never carve meat hot. No, it, no. you know what? If you want, and also to keep it warm, just put a piece of foil over it and let it sit for 10, 15 minutes. Pretty much you're, you're ready to go. So now, uh, carving a duck is actually like carving a chicken or a turkey. Okay. So if you're going to do a turkey for the holidays, it's sort of the same philosophy. So now basically, and it's the same anatomy, only yes. a little different. Yes. Exactly. So now what I try to do is I'm going to go for the legs because yes. there's a little place right in here and and let the bird kind of fall naturally. Yes. So now I can make this slice right here and even if I didn't get it perfectly, if your bird is cooked correctly, it's just going to fall away right where the part of the uh, thigh is. And then all you have to do is take your knife, and we're just gonna take it away from the bone. Okay, so there's one leg off, and... Okay, that's fine. And then here, I'll show you what you wanna do with the breast. Okay. So now down the center here is the breast bone. Mm -hmm. And then what you wanna do is you're gonna take your knife, and again, there's at first it's sort of like not knowing what's going on. But once your knife gets in there, you're going to go on one side right. of the duck breast. And you're just going to follow it down. And then this is the wishbone right here. Uh -huh. So you take your knife. You're going to follow that wishbone. And you're going to follow. And then it's hot. But if you can, you want to come and kind of just pull the meat away from the bone. And if it's cooked right, it should just fall away from the bone. Uh, it, 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 yeah. And so the goal here is to preserve as much of the duck breast as possible. Right. And then, you know, and then once it's cut, let's say you're doing a turkey or a chicken, you can turn this over and then we can slice it. Isn't that pretty? So it's a little bit more so presentable and, and easier right. to eat. Right. So. Everything is cooked and ready to plate, and you've decided to do this sort of family style. I'm going to do this family style because it's sort of a rustic way of cooking. It brings people together at the table. We have these lovely roasted olives. Which imparts flavor, but at the same time is going to be part of our meal. Exactly. And if you see, there really isn't that much fat. A lot of people, when I say to comfy the whole duck, it's like, oh, that's a lot of fat. Well, it is a lot of fat, but look how. It doesn't end up with the duck. Yeah, you're not you're not having this greasy, fatty just meal. Just a little reminder from today's lesson: confit is cooking the meat in its fat slowly. Slowly, yes. It's a. So it, we're getting all the flavor, but we don't have to. The, there isn't that much fat at the end of the day. Right. All right. So. So now you can just take a spatula, and you're going to pick this all up. And you're just going to... And again, you slow, showed us how to remove the duck breast meat and then slice it for right. it's more accessible to our diners. So we're just oh, going to put them on here. And we're set to go. Okay, chef. And you're set. We're going to go up to the bar. We're going to pair this with the wine. And then we're going to sit down and enjoy the feast. All right, we have just been in the kitchen at the American restaurant with their executive chef, Debbie Gold. We've prepared duck confit. We have roasted a potato cake in the duck fat, got some olives going on. What to drink with this signature dish? To answer that question, we're going to talk to Jamie Jamison, 
the managing director and wine director of, you wear several hats here, don't you, the yes. American? But I think you have the answer. What should we drink? Well, usually when it goes to duck, I would say Pinot Noir, especially Burgundy, but okay. um, just having been in the, uh, the Rhone Valley this mm -hmm. last spring, I was taught a lesson about duck and how well that the Rhone wines go. Um, Hermitage is what I had when I was there, but that's a little pricey for most okay. people. So we want to make this a little more user friendly. Uh, this is a Chateau Neuf de Pop, which is a Grenache based wine. It has the Garrigue, which is kind of the um, potpourri uh, spices, but it has a licorice and a little tapenade. And with the mm. olive base, the, it, it matches very well with uh, the duck and the richness of the duck. Um, the Syrah, just a touch of Syrah in there, helps cut that heaviness too. Okay, so you selected these flavors to pair with our deck. I think we should go to the dining room and I think we should taste your suggestion. Excellent. Okay. Hello, I'm Bonnie Rabikoff, and we have been back in the kitchen at the American Restaurant with their executive chef, Debbie Gold. Their wine director, Jamie Jamison, has paired this dish with wine. Thank you both again for inviting me here to this very, very lovely restaurant. We have duck confit with olives and roasted onions and a potato cake and Jamie, what wine did you select again? It's the, the Domaine Pierre Useglio Chateau Neuf de Pop. I'm so glad you said 2009. <laughs> okay. Do we get to dig in? Dig in. Let's go for it. And this is what you do. This is cooked, what you do. You spend time with the people that you care about and share. Well, and you know what? What's fun, and I kept this oh very goodness. simple because if you have to have your cranberry sauce, or if you have to have your dressing for the holidays, it still work. It'll still work perfectly with. This. Oh, all of the. Oh, this is amazing. It is crisp. It is delicious. It is not greasy, even though it was cooked in duck fat. <laughs> the flavors are amazing. Everybody gets crispy skin. Everybody. There's no <laughs> fights at the table. You know, right, and so what a now. great and exciting way to serve, make a festive meal around the holidays that isn't traditional turkey or ham and okay, are we tasting this? I am. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, to your health and to life. I am. And to the <laughs> yes, and to happy, wonderful holidays. Yeah, season. enjoy the holidays. Mmm. Oh, this is beautiful. Oh, that is heaven. That's beautiful. It's got mm -hmm. a lot of flavor. It pairs nicely with, like you like like the richness that goes with mm -hmm. it. Um, oh, it! I I don't know that I've tasted quite that flavor. Oh, See, that's amazing! We're teaching you something new. Well, that's why we're, that time. is why we're in the kitchen. And and you know, I want to thank you both and Debbie for always being so generous of spirit with this community, with your time and your talent. Um, and for preserving what has been the reputation of this fabulous institution. And Jamie, for bringing all your skills here. You, you make Kansas City proud for our visitors. Thank you both. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bonnie Rabakoff, and this week we are in the cellar with Marquis Selections to talk about rosés. And with me is their managing director, Chris Cribb. Once again, thank you for inviting us into your cellar. Sure, Bonnie. Great to be here. Okay, rosé. Now, that's been a little controversial with wine enthusiasts, like rosés neither here nor there. What do you think? Well, I give me the hard question right off the I bat. I know, you know we're not messing around here. Wine, wine enthusiasts for a while didn't for a while. really didn't think that it was quite up to snuff. Okay. You know, it was a uh, and a very easy drinking wine, and not very many serious winemakers would make a rosé. What's changed? What's changed in the last probably 15 years? Mm -hmm. The um, the idea of having lighter wines, yes. uh, having more food-friendly wines has grown. So you find a winemaker that's doing a lot in, say, a region like Napa, California, that says, you know, I maybe I make a Chardonnay and I make a Cabernet, 
but I don't, I need something a little lighter to drink with some of my everyday type fare. Those same great winemakers, when they put their hand to rosé, can make something really interesting and exciting. Okay, yeah. so, and we're looking at a wine from Italy and a wine from Argentina. Yeah, well, we, okay. we decided to go ahead and just go around the globe today. Okay, so I brought my globe so I can show you a little bit about okay. where we're going. <laughs> okay. Um, but we, um, we've started, uh, we've got one rosé from uh, Mendoza, Argentina. Okay. It is a uh, Malbec, mm -hmm. um, so that's the grape type. Which and we normally think of as deep red wine. Deep red wine. Deep red wine. Deep red wine. So okay. And you, you'll see here on the table and in our glasses, it's that bright, bright pink. Okay. Um, so that then. What the, are we gonna? T and what's the other one? And the other wine that we brought out is um, a uh, Grignolino, which is a grape type you probably never tasted and no, I a have lot not. of people never have heard of. Right. Uh, it is produced only in the Piedmont region of Italy, and it is a very um, Thick skin grape mm -hmm. with a, with very large uh, pips, like very large seeds in the grape. Which so when they when they found that they found that when it is a red wine, but it makes a, such a light red wine that it's it's a rosé. It's a rosé. So I'm kind of blending. Okay. I'm fighting between that where your Pinot Noirs are that are a little bit fruity and heavier. Um, to the the really light blush whites that you find or you know what people used to just call it the uh, white Zinfandel. White Zinfandel. We had to, we had to, you had we, to, had to say it. we had to put it into this conversation. Okay. And that's we said other, it? We that's said That's the it. other thing. People used to think that blush wine, rose wines were white Zinfandel. It's really not the case it's anymore. Not, There's a no. lot of good stuff out there. So okay. the first All wine right. here, the um, the Malbec Rose find that it's got that uh, strawberry. It does. That was the first thing that came up. Kind of that uh, watermelon. Um, it's it, Because it is made from that Malbec grape, you, you also find uh, a little bit of that dark fruit in there. I, so it, it's got that real light color, but it's more of that, say, dark cherry flavors. Um, Kind of so lighter, if Malbec isn't going to work for you because it, it's too intense, yeah. this would do it. Yes, it's, it's a great, oh. way, great way to taste it. The, uh, the winemaker does this all organically, very fresh. We love um, that he does that. And the, the fact of the matter is that this wine comes from his 80-year-old vineyards. And he does it uh, where it's the, the Sanjay method, which means he crushes the grapes and bleeds off part of the juice. Uh -huh. So it's that dark, deep, you know, but instead of sitting on the skins, like the reserved Malbec right. that he makes, he just rushes this right into the winery, right into a tank. And so it's that light skin contact, which is the skin contact is what gives the, the wine the color. All right, so for people who have some difficulty with tannins, but wish they could do more red, this, this might work. This is good. You know, this is the, the red wine compound, Reservatol, is that uh, healthy red wine compound they found yes. that um, really is supposed to be really good for your heart and your health. So yes. uh, rosé is a great way to get it without having to have it in, in, in a nice chill format. Okay, so it's going to be chilled. What do we want to serve with this? You know, I there's a lot of different things. Very, very versatile. Very, very versatile. Okay. You know, you from... Um, Burgers to um, you know something that's uh, got a, a larger pizzas are always nice. Oh, that would be great. Um, with pizza. Even any of your um, your more grilled grilled fish is always a good one too. Um, like a seared tuna or something like that would be a very nice. That fish. would be great. All right, so we're going to leave Argentina. We're going to Italy. We love Italy. So spin around the globe spin here. Spin around the globe. And this is back to um, Piedmont. So the Quattro Leone, Green Milino, one of the real interesting things I find about um, this grape and the, uh, the region that what we have with Castello di Gabbiano is a producer that works as a nursery to keep this grape alive. It was almost extinct, and so they created their own nursery and propagate plants out to uh, to help others in the area grow it. This is your light red. You know, mm. like I said, it gets a little, I think a little more earthy than the last one, where the last one was a little oh, it more, is. Um, a more dry and very fruity. This one is a little bit more earthy, kind of gives is. you that crushed leaves feel mm. to it. Um, mm. I what would think you that serve with this it? would be the great, uh, Complement to that charcut charcuterie plate that's got mm. you know a little bit of, of 
wonderful salmon meats or, and yeah, cheeses, cheeses and, and some olives and you know all that that would be traditionally you know what I think would this great way to start a party Absolutely. sitting around a charcuterie tr a tray with this with a nice glass okay. of Grimolino. We appreciate that you travel all over the world no. and handpick these vineyards that we're really not familiar with and these these grape varietals we're not familiar with uh, to make a portfolio that is definitely unique and, and award winning. How do you go about becoming award winning? Well, it starts by finding items that are different from the rest. Uh, you know, we. When we looked at the idea of what we were wanting to do for rosé, for example, these are our two largest selling rosés. In the future, we'll probably have some more, but we're not going to go out and buy white Zinfandel. You know, we take time to hand select unique vineyards, unique regions of the world, and then we do a blind tasting against the competition to ensure that they're um, more successful than and beat out the competition. And beat out the competition. And Wine Spectator agrees with your selections because you have won some very impressive awards from them. Uh, how can we learn more about where these wines are? Where do we go to find them? Um, the best place to, uh, to go is just like you go when you're out shopping for a house these days. Go online. Go online. You know. Start off. Start out at uh, www.marquee.com. M-A-R-Q-U-E-E.com. Yeah, um, we've got a, a nice website that's got all of our wines in the portfolio. It's got information about um, who the producers are, the vineyards, as well as uh, some tools on there to be able to find local uh, retailers and restaurants that are selling them, and uh, our online seller as well. So. Okay, and also if we prefer the phone, what would that number be? Sure, um, one eight 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 M A R Q U E E six two seven seven eight three three. Well, thank you. Wine sometimes feels overwhelming to us when it comes to decision making, and you've gone a long way to help make help us be more informed about. Yeah. How and what and what to be at, right? at the end of the day, Bonnie, I think that um, the best lesson we can have from this rosé is that um, rosé is not white Zinfandel. Nope. And there's some really good values out there. Uh, and wonderful gotta, flavors. Uh, all you have to do is have a good uh, good friend in the wine business tell you where to go. That would, that would be you. Next week, we are going to be in the cellar to explore wines that bubble. Until then, to your health. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.